everybody. Um, my name is Brian Evans. I'm a geography professor here at HCC. Um, I'm going to be presenting uh, a little geography of Japan uh, to you today. And uh, following my presentation, uh, Dr. Miller Waters is going to present the, the two books being featured this semester. Uh, so definitely worth sticking around for that. All right, so um, how many of you feel like you know a lot about Japan? Um, you feel well versed on Japan? Good, I'm glad you're here then. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. For, for sure. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that today, for sure. So, uh, all right, well, Japan um, in, in Japanese is known as Nippon. Uh, Nippon roughly translates as Land of the Rising Sun. Um, this is a tori. A, a tori is an entrance to a shrine, and uh, this is probably the most famous tori in all of Japan. It's in a place called Miyajima, um, and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It marks the entrance of a shrine that dates back to 1128 AD. All right. For any of you who maybe have seen one on my talks before, you may know I like making it a little bit interactive, um, ask you some questions along the way. So let's start with a true-false question from Japan. Tokyo is the world's most populous metropolis. Do you think that's true or false? A number of very large cities around the world. Tokyo is definitely a large city. Is it the largest metropolis in the world? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here. Oh, Far and away, oh, wow. yes. Um, 37 and a half million people live in the Tokyo metropolitan area. That's 10 million more people than live in any other metropolitan area in, in the world. Okay? New Delhi, India is the second largest metro area, but 37 and a half million people. You know, we talk about how big Texas is, the whole state of Texas doesn't even have this population as of yet. Okay, so extremely populous. Tokyo is the present day capital, of course, of Japan. It's been Japan's capital since 1868. In fact, if you uh, translate the name Tokyo, it means Eastern Capital. It literally translates as Eastern Capital. <laughs> okay, so if we see where Japan is situated, we can see it's located in Eastern Asia. It's an island chain. It consists of four major islands, okay, but there's over uh, 6,000 smaller islands as well, extending down to the Ryukus. Um, you may or may not have heard of the Ryukus before, but you've probably heard of Okinawa. Okinawa is one of the Ryukus. Okay. Um, the country arcs from southwest to northeast, and it's roughly shaped like an S. All right. I'm going to be showing you a number of uh, short videos uh, today, um, so you don't have to listen to me yapping the whole time here, okay? Uh, but this first video kind of highlights one of Japan's uh, primary geographic challenges and gives you a nice little introduction to Japan in the process. Japan is a mountainous, volcanic island chain located in the western Pacific Ocean. The islands arc from Russia in the north towards the Korean Peninsula in the south. The country has four main islands, Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu, and thousands of minor ones extending through the Ryukyu Island chain, framing the East China Sea. Japan's rugged terrain and lack of inter-regional connecting rivers isolated its population into separate, densely populated coastal plains. The Yamato Plain, which dominates the Inland Sea, was the birthplace of Japanese civilization. This inland sea saw the rise of early Japanese maritime culture and facilitated communication and political control. As Japanese culture expanded over the island chain, the seat of power moved to the more productive and strategically located Kanto Plain, Japan's core region and home to Tokyo, the world's largest metropolitan area. The country's primary geographic challenge is sustaining its large population on an island with little arable land and few natural resources. Japan's geography has prompted the country to alternate between periods of isolation and expansion. 
When Japan unifies under strong centralized control, it is often drawn towards the continent for resources and land. This happened in the late 1500s and again in the early 1900s, leading to World War II. Given its location, the Korean Peninsula has been the corridor of invasion between Japan and China, and its status remains of strategic importance to Tokyo. The lack of natural resources in Japan continues to force Tokyo to seek them abroad, leaving the country to balance between U.S. naval dominance and Chinese expanding maritime interests. Okay, so with that in mind, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the size and the population of Japan. This first map here that you see uh, compares the size of Japan to the U.S., all right, to give you some perspective. So Japan is an area just under 146,000 square miles. What does that mean? It means that it's a little bit smaller than California in terms of area. Okay, so it's comparable in size to the U.S. of California. It's not one of the largest countries in the world in area. Remember, there are about 196 countries in the world, and Japan's the 61st largest. Most of the population you can see lives on the island of Honshu. Okay? Honshu, if you translate it from Japanese, means mainland. All right? And uh, it's where the heart of Japan's population is. It's where Tokyo is located, for example. And speaking of overall population, Japan is one of the highest uh, ranked countries in the world in terms of overall population. Over 126 million people live there. It's the 10th most populous country on the planet. <laughs> We're going to come back to this throughout the day. Um, Japan has one of the oldest populations in the world. Okay? It's the second oldest uh, median age population of any country on the planet. 47.7 years of age. A lot of times when we talk about countries in this series, the U.S. is older than the country we're talking about in terms of the median age, but this is an instance where the U.S. is actually younger by comparison. Okay, So in the U.S., our median population age is about 38.2 um, by comparison. Oh, and this second map here shows you where, large, uh, where the large population centers of Japan are situated, and this is the island of Honshu here. So you see a lot of red on the island of Honshu indicating a significant population centers. If we take a closer look at Japan's environment and topography, I first want to mention uh, climate-wise, uh, it's a pretty temperate climate, uh, fairly mild. Uh, Houston is at about the same latitude as the southern tip of Kyushu, okay, just to give you some perspective there. So um, pretty mild and a relatively wet climate overall, okay? But much of Japan is characterized by high relief. Remember what we mean by high relief hilly and mountainous. Okay, about 70% of Japan is hilly or mountainous. Remember though, we had to talk about 126 million people who live uh, in Japan. So historically, living in hilly and mountainous areas is not so easy. Where Japan's largest urban centers are located, where they developed, was on the flatter plains, okay, like Tokyo and uh, Kanto. Um, the uh, country is located along the Pacific Ring of Fire. How many of you have heard of the Pacific Ring of Fire? Yeah, it's a, a tectonically active part of the world. A lot of earthquakes, volcanoes. Check it out, 108 active volcanoes in Japan. Okay, And you may have heard of a tsunami um, in Japan. We're going to talk more about the big tsunami that struck Japan in 2011. I'll show you a video on that a little bit later as well. So there's a small series of planes along the coastal areas, as I mentioned. It's where a lot of the big cities tend to be located. Uh, the highest peak is uh, Mount Fuji, okay, um, which is one of these volcanoes located in the country. It's over 12,000 feet. Um, I'll talk a little more about Mount Fuji in a bit. Hichiro Gata, Gata means lake, okay, so the lake Hichiro is at the lowest uh, point in the country, 13 feet below sea level. Um, remember, Japan is defined by its islands, over 6,000 altogether, but four main islands. I want to touch on each of these four main islands. The northernmost island here is Hokkaido, right? Hokkaido, uh, which is uh, home to about 20% of the country's area, 
but only about 5% of Japan's population. Uh, major city on Hokkaido is a uh, city of Sapporo. I always like to say it's more than just a beer, okay? It's a major city in Japan. All right, then we have Honshu. Remember, Honshu is the largest in area. It's the most populous as well. Okay? Remember, 80% of the country's population. It's home to the largest metropolitan population uh, of any city on the planet with Tokyo. And then you have uh, the urban triangle of Osaka, which is Japan's second largest city, uh, Kobe, um, and Kyoto. Okay, We'll talk more about Kyoto especially in, in a bit. All right, so uh, that urban triangle is located in the Kansai of plain of Hanshi. The other two major islands are Shikoku. Shikoku, Shikoku excuse me, it only represents 5% of Japan's uh, land area. It's a relatively smaller island with a little more tropical climate. The major city there, the largest city is Matsuyama. And then Kyushu is the southernmost and the westernmost of the major islands in Japan. Um, it's the second most populous island after Honshu. Okay? Largest city here is uh, Fukuoka. Um, another kind of famous city located on Kyushu is the city of Nagasaki, uh, which you may have heard of for historical reasons. All right, here we go with another trivia question. Mount Fuji is an active volcano that has erupted within the past hundred years. Do you think that's true or false? Okay, like the first question, I'm getting a mixed response. That's good, that means some of you are definitely right. Um, uh, so here's the deal. Um, and always pay attention to this in your classes, you know, when you're taking tests. Make sure the entire statement is true. Part of the statement is true, part of it is not, okay? So it is a, an active volcano, if you consider dormant to be active, okay? But the last time it erupted was 1707, so it hasn't erupted in over 300 years. It has the potential to be able to erupt again, and before this, between the 8th century and 1707, it erupted something like 10 times, all right? So it's had very active periods in its history, but this is also, remember, the highest peak in Japan. It's very iconic, and it's also sacred to the Japanese, okay? A lot of people uh, climb it, including, you know, elderly people in their 80s are, are known to climb it uh, with some frequency in the summer months. All right. Oh, by the way, just in case you're curious, Mount Fuji is located only about 65 miles away from Tokyo. And on a clear day in Tokyo, you can actually see Mount Fuji uh, from Tokyo. Okay, so remember that Japan is geologically volatile. Geologically volatile. Uh, it's at the convergence of some tectonic plates. And anytime you find tectonic plates in the same neighborhood, that's the recipe for some geologic volatility, earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunami. So Japan is very vulnerable to earthquakes and tsunami due to its location. The Pacific plate is subducting, meaning it's being forced beneath the North American plate. And there was a major uh, shift in the plates on March 11th 2011. I'll never forget it. It happened during the HEC spring break that year. Okay, um, But the Tohoku uh, earthquake, Japan's largest ever recorded earthquake, a 9.0 on the Richter scale, um, rocked the country. And when that earthquake occurred, it triggered a tsunami. Okay, And I'm going to show you a short video on the tsunami in just a moment. Fortunately, Japan had an early alert system, um, unlike uh, Southeast Asia, where the major uh, tsunami occurred earlier in the 21st century here. Um, so the death toll wasn't nearly as high, but still um, nearly 16,000 confirmed deaths um, here in Japan as a result. And uh, also what made a lot of news was some nuclear power plants were uh, compromised in the process. So there was some meltdowns of some nuclear power plants along the coastline. Uh, compromised by the tsunami. All right, so 
Um, check this out. I mean, this is this image. Fortunately, not a personal photo. Okay, but you can see spilling over a seawall here. Okay, the seawall. Imagine something like this happening in Galveston over the seawall in Galveston. Uh, let's put that in perspective. All right, so let's uh, check out a short video here, um, highlighting this uh, tsunami. All across northern Japan, they felt it. A violent magnitude 9.0 earthquake on March 11, 2011. It was centered about 80 miles offshore and tsunami warnings went up immediately. In coastal cities, people knew what to do next, run to higher ground. It's from these vantage points on hills and in tall buildings that incredible footage was captured. In Kesanuma, people retreated to a high-rise rooftop and could only watch in horror as tsunami waves inundated their city, knocking buildings into rubble and mixing into a kind of tsunami soup filled with vehicles, building parts, and contents. Seawater cascaded over sea walls and into cities. This video shows the water rushing over an 18-foot seawall in the Kamaishi city. The seawall here was the world's deepest and largest, but not enough for the magnitude of the March 11 disaster. It was the largest quake ever known in Japan, and one of the five largest recorded in the world. More than 28,000 people are confirmed dead or missing. When two tectonic plates push together under the sea, the resulting earthquake sends an enormous burst of energy up through the ocean, displacing enormous quantities of water. With the upward motion, a series of waves expands in all directions. In deep water, these waves travel fast, up to 500 miles an hour, but only reach a height of a few feet. A passing ship might not even notice. But as the waves enter shallow waters, friction with the ocean floor lowers the wave's speed, but raises their height. This video is from a Japan Coast Guard ship confronting a tsunami wave in shallow water on March 11. And a rare view from the air, video of a tsunami wave approaching the shoreline. In Japan, some tsunami waves reach as far as three miles inland. Japan may be the most seismologically studied country in the world, and with more than 1,200 high-precision GPS stations, a geophysicist at the University of Alaska used the data to create a visualization of the March 11 quake. The waves of displacement that you see were moving as fast as five miles per second. In this photo, the ripples of tsunami waves are seen moving upstream in the Naka River at Hitachi Naka City. New technology left an enormous amount of visual evidence for study in years to come and can perhaps help us better understand the power of earthquakes and tsunamis and prevent loss of life in the future. Samurai B. Again, no one interested. 
Okay. C, geisha. Anybody think it's geisha? A few of you, tepidly. Okay. And D, karaoke. Okay. Okay, so we had a few for geisha. Uh, the majority said karaoke. Bonsai means 10,000 years. Okay? It's kind of like a, a kin of saying hip hip hooray. All right? Uh, samurai is a warrior. Um, uh, you may know of, uh, it means those who serve, if you translate it from Japanese. Karaoke means empty orchestra. Okay? <laughs> It's been super popular since the 1970s, especially. By the way, okay, I've, I've had the uh, good fortune of going to Japan before. If you ever want a great, great cultural experience, go to a karaoke bar in Japan. Very different from the karaoke experience here in the U.S. You know, here in the States, you know, when we think of karaoke, we think of maybe getting up in front of a bar and singing in front of a bunch of strangers, and if you're a really bad singer like me, you really make a mockery of yourself, right? That's how, not how it works in Japan. Okay, in Japan, you get a booth, okay, your own private booth, you go in with some friends and family, and they serve you food and drinks, and, and you just rock the night away with your friends and family, and it's a totally different experience. I heard there's actually Japanese-style karaoke bars in Houston, okay? So one of the many great reasons to live in Houston uh, you have access to that if you don't want to go to Japan uh, to experience that right away. Okay, but that by process of elimination here means the correct answer is C, geisha. All right? A lot of people don't realize the first geisha were actually men who had a similar role uh, to traditional geishas, um, but they were kind of like court jesters. Um, but Throughout its history, most geisha uh, have been women, all right? And let me clear up a common misconception, because um, sometimes people think that geisha were like prostitutes. They were not, okay? They were highly cultured women, um, known for their demure conversation, graceful dancing, okay? Uh, women of the arts, all right? Uh, so, geisha, uh, in Kyoto, by the way, um, is where the heart of what remains of the geisha tradition uh, is centered on, okay, in, in Kyoto. Okay. Oh, by the way, if you've ever seen memoirs of a geisha, take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Very Hollywood-infused, uh, if you've ever seen that movie. All right. If we take a closer look at Japan's history, first let me start with Japan has at least 30,000 years of archaeological evidence of human presence in this part of the world. Okay, so there's a long-standing human history in Japan. But where I want to pick up with is Kyoto, okay? In 794 AD, when it was established as Japan's capital. All right, so of course we know that Tokyo is Japan's modern-day capital, but for over a thousand years, Kyoto, which is often considered the cultural heart of Japan to this day, and by the way, one of the only places in all of Japan that was spared from bombing during World War II, so the many cultural riches that we find in Kyoto, fortunately, are still intact today, but it served as capital for over a thousand years. Then, um, the Tokugawa dynasty uh, emerged in 1603 and had a very profound impact on Japan uh, from 1603 to 1868. During this time in Japan's history, the country really turned inward. They were pretty isolationist uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, you know, uh, foreigners and other faith-based uh, systems like Christianity were expelled from Japan during this time. Um, trade was limited to one port city in the entire country, Nagasaki, okay, and limited just to trade with the Dutch and the Chinese. But then. Around 1853, an American uh, by the name of Commodore Perry, his name was actually Matthew Perry, but not the one from Friends, okay? Commodore Matthew Perry sailed into the 
the harbor of Tokyo, which was at this time known as Edo. Okay, Edo was the former name of Tokyo. He sailed into the harbor, and I don't know if you're taking notes on this, but if you are, make sure you put this in quotes. He persuaded the Japanese to open up trade with the West. Persuaded, okay? What was Commodore Perry's method of persuasion? He had his entire fleet of ships' cannons pointed towards the city of Tokyo. Pretty good chance you can get your way in your terms uh, when you have that kind of situation. So through this, Japan started to open up once again, set the stage for what we call the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration was a time of reform in Japan. One of the first things they did was they relocated the capital from Kyoto to Tokyo. Okay? This is also the time period when Japan became a major military and economic force. Um, an imperialist force. Okay. So, Japan expanded um, so much that by the 1930s, their empire included the Korean Peninsula, northeastern China, an area of China known as Manchuria, the Ryukyu Islands, and Taiwan. All right. Um, of course, between 1937 and 1945, Japan was very much engaged in war with neighbors and ultimately the world. And much of that was World War II, of course. Japan very dramatically, of course, uh, lost the Second World War, culminating with the dropping of the two atomic bombs, all right? One in Nagasaki and the other in Hiroshima. Hiroshima was actually the first uh, bomb that was dropped. Uh, this, for all intents and purposes, ended Japan's imperialist era. Then, in the uh, mid-1940s into the early 1950s, uh, Japan was occupied by the Allies. Okay, and this really marked a, a shift in Japan's history. Okay, and the second half of the 20th century was marked by a dramatic economic recovery, and Japan became one of the most successful and industrialized countries on the planet in this time period. So, uh, industrial leader, a fully urbanized society, a uh, political power, a very affluent country. All right. By the way, Japan, their history of wartime conduct that dates back to the World War II period, even though Japan has been a very peaceful country overall since World War II, Japan's neighbors in the region still often view Japan with suspicion, you know, what their motivations are. So, countries like uh, the Koreas, uh, China, um, even other neighbors like the Philippines sometimes greet Japan with some suspicion, dating back to this time period. All right. Ready for another trivia question? All right. Maybe some of you have heard that this year uh, uh, Tokyo is going to be hosting the Olympic Games. Okay. So, when Tokyo hosts the Olympics this year, it will mark the first time in Japan's history to host the Summer Olympics. Is that true or false? So true. False. Okay, uh, most of you I'm hearing say false. All right? And that's correct. All right? Japan became the first country in all of Asia to ever host an Olympic Games, a modern Olympic Games, uh, when they hosted, uh, they, when Tokyo hosted the Olympics in 1964. Okay, so over 50 years ago, um, and Japan has also hosted a couple of Winter Olympic Games, uh, most recently in 1998. All right, so I want to show you a little clip, a little preview. Uh, of, you know, things to come for uh, this year's Olympic Games. In a city that seems eternally on time, where tradition meets technology, they're as good as ready for the biggest ever Olympics. Welcome to Tokyo. 
we should say, welcome back. Tokyo held the Games in 1964, the first in Asia. Now that Olympic Stadium has been demolished and rebuilt for this second of three Asian Olympic Games in a row. And history will be made again next year. A record 339 medal events and 33 sports will include five new events, including three that target a younger, more extreme audience. Surfing, Olympic rock climbing and skateboarding will make their debut in Tokyo. The Olympics is just a year away. Will you win gold? Yes. Of course, swimming and gymnastics will once again take center stage with Americans leading the way. This has been her destiny. This is the giant stadium. This is in San Francisco. America's national pastime is this country's favorite sport. If Olympic baseball is anything like this, you guys are in for a treat. While this will be the boxing venue. Renewal, recycling, combining old and new. This arena neatly symbolizes the hopes of 2020. It is the Tokyo home of Japan's historic national sport. That's right, sumo wrestling. Watch out for the premiere of Olympic karate too. At Tokyo's clubs, they're predicting a gold medal. Hey! Medals which will be made from old electronics, including recycled phones and laptops. And Tokyo's newest technology will be on show. This cyborg-style frame helping officials lift heavy Olympic weights. Got anything you need lifting, Kyle? Okay, so some camera gear. Here we go. Oh, yeah. This time of year, Tokyo gets hot. It's going to be like holding an Olympics in New Orleans. I have never been to New Orleans, so... <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> in the summer, it's hot and humid. This time next summer, the games of the 32nd Olympiad will be getting underway as the Olympic spotlight once again turns to Tokyo. See you in Tokyo! All right, um, if we shift uh, to uh, Japan's uh, political framework, um, we find that it's a constitutional monarchy, a parliamentary constitutional monarchy, say that 10 times fast. Um, it consists of 47 prefectures, which are like subdivisions, almost like counties or states. The current constitution was drafted right after the Second World War. And the prime minister is Shinzo Abe. Um, he serves as the head of Japan's government. He's uh, served as Japan's uh, prime minister since uh, 2012, December of 2012. Um, if we take a closer look at Japan's uh, demographics, and again, uh, this is uh, Japan's current flag. We find that Japan, you know, here in the States, we live in a very multicultural society. It's a very different kind of portrait in Japan. It's much more homogenous. That means that over 98% of Japan's population is ethnically Japanese. Okay, so much more homogenous population there. And also, in terms of language, uh, Japanese far and away is the most spoken language uh, within Japan, uh, the native tongue. Close to 70% of the population uh, practices a blend of Buddhism and Shintoism. Okay? Buddhism and Shintoism. Um, many practice a blend of both. Buddhism did not start in Japan, but it arrived there in about the 5th century AD. Okay, And Shintoism is a polytheistic a belief in multiple higher powers, um, a polytheistic faith uh, that originated in Japan. It's indigenous to Japan. Check this out. Japan, um, you may know, is renowned for its education system. The high school graduation rate in Japan is 96.7%. It's one of the highest high school graduation rates in the world. Here in the US, our graduation rate is about 83% by comparison. Okay. Um, the life expectancy at birth, another outstanding figure here. 85.5 years of age. Let me tell you something. Japan's birth rate is so relatively low, and uh, you could see a significant elderly population lives in Japan. Adult diapers outsell baby diapers in Japan. Okay, That should give you perspective on its population composition. This is the second highest life expectancy of any country in the world after Monaco, okay, that microstate in Europe. All right. The 
biggest demographic challenge facing Japan, therefore, is this aging population. All right. Um, back in 2003, 19% of Japan's population was over the age of 65. Okay. In 2003, what many of us would deem as elderly. Okay. 19% by 2025, which is kind of right around the corner, it's estimated that almost a quarter of Japan's population will be over the age of 65. Why is this a challenge? Well, remember, much of the elderly population is out of the working age population. So that puts more pressure on the working age population to support that segment of society. Something tells me, you know, Japan is also renowned for the kind of care and a reverence it gives its elderly population. So something tells me that this elderly population will be in good hands in the future, but um, it does pose some challenges to Japan at the same time. If current demographic trends continue, you know, a lot of countries are rapidly growing in population. Japan's the opposite, right? Now it's shrinking, okay? It's one of the few countries in the world where the population, and I'm not talking about the population getting smaller, I'm talking about literally fewer people. If current demographic trends continue, Japan's population is expected to shrink to about 100 million people uh, by 2050. Remember, it's at just over 126 million people right now. All right, this uh, next video, it's a little bit longer. It's about eight minutes, but it gives you such a great slice of life. But, you know, I like to try to give you a sense of the culture, you know, in these presentations. This gives you a great sense of the culture, and you might think it's, wow, this is a little different than how things are typically in the States, okay? So I hope you enjoy it. It's a really fascinating piece entitled Japan's Independent Kids. かわいい子にはタリオサヘロ。ごめんなさい。ごめんなさい。ごめんなさい。ごめんなさい。ごめんなさい。ごめんなさい。ごめんなさい。ごめんなさい。ごめんなさい。ごめんなさい。ごめん
れ。切れてるんだけど。<笑>これな。<笑><笑> Jake Adelstein was the first Westerner to work a crime beat in Japan, giving him an insight into Japanese crime and justice no other Westerner has. He, like many foreigners, noticed something different about Japan. As I was walking to the station, I would see the kids coming from the station with their little backpacks on, walking towards the school, thinking, where, where are the adults? Like, there's, who's making sure these kids cross the road and, you know, get to school okay? Even my own daughter. When she was about four or five, and she said, I "I'm just going to walk to, I'm going to walk there myself," and she left. And、uh, you know, I put down the phone, chased after her. She ran all the way to school, and of course, nothing happened to her. And I was like, you know, maybe in Japan, that's how it works. It's Monday morning on Sydney's affluent Lower North Shore, where the Fraser family is starting the day. My name is Rob Fraser.、I, I'm 47 years of age. There's three of us in the family. There's myself, there's Jane, and Emily, who's 10. There's an apple in your bag, Em. Please don't leave the apple in your bag all week. Am I turning lights off again? Yeah. All right. Tennis rackets in the car. Have you ever gone to school by yourself? No. Not yet. Well, if you were in Japan, you would have been going to school for four years by yourself already. Wow. What do you think about that? Um, it's cool. <laughs> Had a conversation with her the other day about, you know, what would she like to do? You know, would she like to get the bus to to school, and、uh, would she like to go on her own? She made it very clear that she would like to do that. The one thing I'm most looking forward to in high school is walking home from school by myself and having a key and everything. Right, give me a kiss.、Mm. And I'll see you later. In fact, studies show kids want to walk to school. It's their parents that won't or can't. The evidence is irrefutable that children are not safe to cross roads on their own until they're ten. That's why we're so nervous about children being allowed to walk on their own to school, even though they might be on the on the footpath the whole way. But it should be safe. You see, Emily's school, Middle Harbour Public, was the first to trial a 40 kilometre per hour school zone in Australia. It's also a cultural reason. If you look at the way Australians behave when they reach a school zone, I mean, a lot of people have one thing on their minds, and that's themselves. They don't care less about anyone else. Group socialisation is huge in Japan. Having parents pick up and drop off their kids would be bad for Japan Incorporated, and that's one of the reasons you probably don't see it. It's also one of the other reasons that Japan. And Japanese society is set up to make it safe for kids to commute to school because if parents have to be responsible for that commute,、um, they're going to have to reorganize the entire workforce and the way companies work. Japan, of course, has an exceptionally low crime rate. They have more than five times the population of Australia, but less than four times the homicides we have. I have covered very few cases of children being abducted. Maybe one child death in, in the 12 years I was a reporter. That's the only one that I can encounter. But to say kids go alone to school because of a low crime rate would miss more subtle and underlying forces. Our society suffers from a paranoia about leaving children on their own. I think some of it's probably ill perceived, but a lot of it is understood. I don't believe there's any more dangers now,、uh, other than traffic, than there were 30, 40 years ago. I think the fact that it's more in the public eye, it's in the press all the time. But I think also the social pressure element of letting go and, and, and letting them go and do things at、uh, such a young age, I think, is is actually quite difficult to to take on. Kawaiko literally means cute kid, and Tabi Sasiro has put them on a trip. So the meaning is. If you love your kids, or you want your kids to be smarter, send them to do something. Send them on a trip. Kawaii ko ni wa tabi o sasero. Kono imi wa kahogo ni nari sugi zu ni dekiru hain no koto wa hitori de yaraseru. Ma aru imi chotto 
、まあ、突き放すと言いますか、うん、っていう意味じゃないですかね。Kids that are less independent nowadays, they, they, it's just the way it is. You have got me thinking about it, and you've got me thinking that maybe I'm,、uh, uh, I'm being a little bit paranoid. I feel like that can be an entire conversation in itself, that, that video, and I, I would love to hear what you think, but、um, for the purposes of time, we're going to. Continue on here, all right? But a little different, right? I mean, I, I think maybe Australia, the, the way it's done in Australia is kind of what resonates probably more with how it's done in the States, right?、Um, as far as、uh, how we treat kids、uh, in, that, in that way. All right, one last trivia question.、Okay. There was actually a little hint about this in one of the previous videos. Sumo wrestling remains Japan's most popular spectator sport. Is that true or false? False. Ooh, I could tell you're paying attention to that other video. That's absolutely correct, okay? You can consider it the national sport in many ways. It has its origins in Japan. By the way,、uh, many sumo wrestlers follow this strict diet and regimen. Um, when they become sumo wrestlers,、um, they weigh as much as 330 pounds on, on average, all right, and have strict diets of 20,000 calories a day.、Okay. But anyhow, very、uh, important sport. Check it out in the Olympics if you, if you have a chance. But Japan,、uh, its national sport is baseball, okay, which obviously is quite popular in these parts as well. Right?、Um, there's some very famous Japanese ballplayers in the major leagues,、um, and Japan has its own major league system as well. Okay? Probably the most recognizable name to many people,、uh, even though he just recently retired, is Ichiro Suzuki.、Okay? But、uh, uh, Yu Darvish is a famous, active、uh, Japanese baseball player, for example. All right. Real quickly,、um, if we look at Japan's economic portrait, it remains one of the、uh, most industrialized, most prosperous, affluent countries in the world.、Um, it's described as a high income country,、uh, it's an advanced economy despite having a scarcity of natural resources.、Um, it had explosive economic growth for the second half of the 20th century. It's since slowed down, but Japan does remain an economic giant,、uh, not only regionally, but globally. Most of its、uh, labor force is in the service sector, as you can see, but over a quarter of the population is in the、uh, industrial sector as well. Now, I think I maybe mentioned to you many, many years ago, when I was much closer to your age, many of your ages than what I am now,、um, I had the great opportunity to visit Japan. So I wanted to show you a few pictures as proof that I was there, okay? But show you some insight into Japan as well, okay? So, Remember, this is pre digital photography, folks, so it's not like National Geographic here, all right? But、uh, this first image is the Shinkansen. That's the famous Japanese bullet train、uh, that travels at speeds of up to 200 miles per hour.、Okay? This is in the Sakusa district of Tokyo,、um, uh, leading to a famous shrine in that quarter of the city. Yes. Believe it or not, that's me. Like, this is in like 1999.、All、right?、Um, you remember that image you saw right at the beginning of the presentation of this Tori? Okay, that's at that same spot in, in Miyajima. And this is what we call floating Tori, okay?、Um, but really amazing. Hiroshima. If you ever visit Japan, I highly recommend paying a visit to Hiroshima. It's a very profoundly powerful city to visit. Remember, it was where the first. Uh, atomic bomb was dropped. In the heart of Hiroshima, where the, the bomb was dropped, today they have a peace park. It's very moving and powerful. <laughs> and the message is basically we experience this personally, and our wish is that this never happens anywhere else in the world ever again. That's one of the overriding messages. This is the Kinkakuji Temple. There's over a thousand temples and shrines in the city of Kyoto. 
cultural heart of Japan in many ways. This is, uh, means the Temple of the Golden Pavilion, okay? Beautiful temple located in Kyoto. All right, I want to leave you with one last short video with um, some great images, quite a bit better than these images, of Japan. All right. understand it less. Um, so for example, if you hear one person's story, and it's one person's story of terror, or one person is kidnapped, we are all obsessed with it, right? And you've got a 24-hour news cycle on it. If we hear statistics about a large number of people being hurt, we care less about it. In the first case, when there's one person who's the center of the story, 
there's this thing that happens where you think, oh, that could be me, or oh, that could be somebody I know. But with statistics, we get this weird distance from it. Um, even worse, there's, this, there's a, one recent study that looked at the way we think and act, and it gave one group the story of one person, it gave another group statistics, and then it gave a third group both the story and the statistics. And you would think that the group that got both the story and the statistics would be more empathetic and more caring, and they were the least caring of both groups. So we have to figure out what to do with our brains when we are faced with trying to comprehend big, big tragedy, right? I've been thinking about this a lot as I've been listening to what's going on in Australia. This is just an aside. But you know, when you hear reports that half a billion animals have died, right? Your brain just can't even begin to comprehend at that kind of scope. So Richard Ward Perry um, is an award-winning British foreign correspondent who has been stationed in um, Asia and Japan for many, many years. Uh, he works for the Times of London and goes to the tsunami as his third book. Um, it came out last year, or the year before last, 2018. Um, it won uh, the Folio Prize uh, for nonfiction writing. And it's into this phenomenon that he tries to tell us a story about big tragedy. Here's how the New York Times describes his, his book. A strikingly vivid, even visceral writer, Lord Perry sweeps away distractions. He will not deal at all, he tells us at the outset, with the meltdown of the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant to offer tightly focused and consuming human stories. The Tohoku region where the tsunami struck has always been known in his right telling as a notorious frontal realm of barbarians, goblins, and bitter cold. A place where blind female shamans still gather every year at a volcano, at a volcano called Mount Fear. It's a place of rugged, tradition-loving, rural folk far from the lack of neatness of Tokyo people. In other hands, this might read like suggestible new ageiness. But Lloyd Perry, who has lived in Tokyo since 1995, is a seasoned foreign correspondent wise enough not to write off currents that simply happen to be less visible. The New York Times goes on. Lloyd Perry knows just how to make immediate and terrifying the strange almost human presence of a 120-foot wave that peeled the macadam off the roads, stripped homes from their foundations, and left bodies on top of buildings. Yet what he evokes even more keenly is a rage he finds almost welcome in a land known for its quietism and restraint. Yes, the Japanese villagers rendered homeless by the calamity were often so calm and self-possessed that their most constant offers of cookies and candies embarrassed the foreign journalist who sought to interview them. But in the central scene, Lord Perry also gives us a confrontation between bereaved parents and the principal of the Okawa school who can't explain how students two and a half miles inland were swallowed up by the tsunami. A typical cry from one of the furious villagers goes something like, come and talk to us after you find your own child like that, you bastard. Right. So what he tries to do is tell this big story by focusing in on this one location. And the book is really br brilliant because it tries to give you top context so that everybody, whether you're part of the culture or not, can better understand what was kind of going on there. And it is a story about ghosts. He spent some time talking about actual ghosts. Um, there were all of these reports of ghost sightings and, ex and people who had been possessed and priests all over, especially in the northern part of Japan, were trying to assuage the ghost because so many people had been taken away so suddenly. And in that part of J Japan particularly, the thin line between what is alive and what is dead is really um, it, it's pervious, right? People can go through and on the other side. So there are real ghosts that they're trying to deal with. There's also 
ghost of political failures at almost every level when this happened. So although Japan is in this really hot spot and they're really good at construction, right? Like the buildings held out through this 9.6 you know, earthquake, the, the buildings did fine. But the central government was um, unable to respond fully and helpfully to all parts of Japan. Uh, in the local level, the northern part of the main island is where the tsunami really hit, and there were lots of um, failures on the local level in trying to help and protect some of the people. Um, one, uh, oh, Ari Hoda in The Guardian talks about also some historical ghosts um, that this book tries to deal with, and this is how um, Ari describes it. Um, those parents were up against a peculiar kind of historical ghost, the spirit of a powerful state-centered ideology that had proved so useful in Japan's catch-up modernization of the 19th century. This ideology regards the people as servants of the state. Those who quibble with the official line are seen at best as nuisances and at worst as selfish troublemakers who should be ostracized. The apparent danger is that people stop exercising the power of individual judgment, which can lead to deadly conformism, as was the case with the elderly family, um, this is a story in the book, who parked their car on a hill after the tsunami warnings, and then dutifully walked back down the hill to report at the evacuation center. And of course, they didn't, they didn't survive. So there are all different kinds of ghosts that he's talking about um, in this book that's, uh, that's really interesting. It's a non-fiction book, which means it's based on real things. Um, from a foreign correspondent who had been living in the region and speaking the language for many years. He was there when the earthquake happened, and he was there to report on the, the tsunami as it happened and the aftermath. It took him about six months to gather all of the information. So he bears witness um, to the Japanese people of the North. He experienced it kind of tangentially, he would say, but he bears witness to what happened and then tries to tell the story to the rest of us so that we can better, better understand it. This national disaster um, had the most mass death in Japan since the two bombs that Professor um, Evans talked about, right? So this is a huge um, national disaster that in some cases were, was made worse in some regions because of um, the response to it. So here's how um, The Guardian wraps it. Ghost of the Tsunami is a brilliant chronicle of one of the modern world's worst disasters, but it's also a necessary act of witness. The stories Perry tells are wrenching, and he refuses to mitigate the enormity of the tsunami with false optimism or saccharine feel-good anecdotes. Above all, it's a beautiful meditation on grief, which he writes, doesn't resolve anything any more than a blow to the head or a devastating illness. It compounds stress and complication. It multiplies anxiety and tension. It opens fissures into cracks and cracks into gaping chasms. So it's a really interesting telling of this event, uh, which has um, still has ramifications, of course, we are going to get the incredible opportunity um, to hear this writer talk to us by Skype. He's going to Skype in and um, talk to us. So we're going to figure out a way where everybody will be able to get to see our conversation with the writer of this book. All right. Next one. So this is about sort of unexpected death, right? This is a whole different thing about death, right? Um, it's uh, a manga. Have, have any of y'all read graphic novels or comic books before? Which ones have you read? Which ones do you like? Okay, superhero comics. Watchmen, maybe? Uh, no. no. Um, how about Walking Dead? Am I the only Walking Dead person? Walking Dead. Okay. Um, so, superhero comics. Um, Walking Dead is a big, uh, is a big series, right? Um, this one has been compared to The Crow. It's been compared a little bit to The Watchmen. Um, it's been compared to Devil's Rejects. It's a manga from Japan. 
Um, and what is so cool about it is, uh, so those of you who are um, from another culture, and you have come here and you were studying in a language that's not your first um, about other subjects, you're going to love this. Because what this has done is, you know, um, in the West, we read right to left, top to bottom, what we would call the front of the book to the back, right? This is exactly backwards to many people in the world, right? So this one reads back to front, right to left, right to left? Yes, right to left, and instead of, um, and it does it all the way down the page. So you always start on the right and you go back to the left. So for many Western reader, readers, it takes us a while to get into the flow of reading the story that way, which is glorious for other people who are like, yeah, welcome to our world. It's, it's hard. The other thing that is cool about comics and graphic novels, right, in this book, Richard Lord Perry is trying to paint us a picture in our minds so that we can follow the story, witness the tragedy, and understand um, those stories better, right? In this one, you get not only the, the, what the characters say, you get the artistic rendition of what's going on. And so in between the panels, the way they're set up, also tell a story, right? So from one panel to the next, there may be something that happens there in your head that you imagine, right? And then there are also other representations on the page. So you get to do, you get to have a whole lot of fun as you sort of actively help create the story that comes out of a graphic novel, a comic, or a manga, right? So one of the great things about this particular book is that it asks the great questions of all good comics and graphic novels, right? What if you have the power over death? What would you do with it? Could you resist the temptation to use it for your own sense of justice? Or would you give in and take matters in your own? Right? How would you decide if you, who's going to live and who's going to die? So what happens at the very beginning is um, there are these gods of death in Japan who have a book death mode, right? And one of them accidentally drops it into the human world. And the smartest high school student in Japan happens to pick it up, right? And he starts learning the rules of the death mode. And he very quickly discovers that he's going to have the power to decide who dies, when they die, and how they die, right? And so he... I mean, can you imagine, right? So for those of you who are Game of Thrones fans, here he is um, in the position of Daenerys Targaryen. And there has to be some sort of um, calibration about what constitutes a good person and what constitutes a bad person. And he thinks he's got the answers, right? He thinks he knows how to create a better place by getting to decide who does or dies. Um, and for me, asking those kind of big questions, uh, uh, that's the, that's, it's so fun to sort of um, follow the train of thought um, to some, sometimes it's logical extension to see where it takes you. It's sort of a fun intellectual exercise. One reviewer wrote, Death Note is a trip. It is at once a horror story and a black comedy and also a police thriller, a suspense book with supernatural elements. What would a human of above average intelligence do with the key to limitless destructive power? In Light's case, that's the main character, his name is Light. Um, he decides to remake the world according to how best he sees fit. It's very Ozymandias of the Watchmen, punishing the unjust and sacrificing a few for the good of mankind. Of course, the problem inherent with such thinking remains the same. Who should be entrusted with such power? Who watches those who make the decisions about who should live and who should die? His predicament is not groundbreaking or too new. And what that means is lots of really smart people have thought about this really big question. And this is another version of what you get when you think about those big questions. You have big power. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to use it? 
So I think y'all are really going to enjoy working your way through this. Um, for those of you who are Western, um, get ready. You're going to do it backwards, right? Um, for those of you who um, English is your second language and English is the weird one, welcome home, right? <laughs> You're going to love it. Um, so for the series, you have a choice. You can read one or the other, you can read both. And when you go for the scholarship, you can do your work around one or the other, whichever one that you feel like you have the most happy to say about. All right, we look forward to this semester.